Wendy's our expert witness from, uh, <laughs> expert witness, <laughs> testimony from uh, seminary, just getting done with a class on mission insight and evangelism that we talked a little bit about last week. Um, who is our neighbor and learning to love our neighbor, learning to bless them. And what does it mean to bless them as a church? Um, how do we go about doing that? Um, and I got to thinking about that. You know, it's a couple of these words in this passage that I just really want to highlight. Let love be sincere in your version. In my version, it says, let love be genuine. What does love look like that's genuine? And you know, if you pull that word apart in the Greek and look a little closer, that word to be genuine means, you know, that you don't have any hidden agendas. How often do we, you know, we love someone, but we have expectations. We have these other agendas. You know, even, even at church, I've met people who... Um, in fact, some churches have this mindset anyway. A new person walks in the door, you greet them, and all of a sudden there's this whispering going on behind them. I wonder if we can get them to become members. Uh, they'd be great to help out in the youth program. I wonder if they could do this. It, there's this other agenda going on about recruitment or about, in some businesses, it could be about sales. I wonder if I can convince them to buy this. I wonder if I can offer them this or if they can do this for me. You know, genuine love has no expectations. It has no hidden agendas. It's just about learning to bless people because God has blessed us and we have something to offer. This whole sermon series is really about that. It's about understanding that we as the church, we as Christians have the best gift or best offering to bless other people with. The name of Jesus Christ a God who loves others. We have salvation and hope through Jesus Christ. That's what we're offering. However, we often get stuck behind this, this barrier of, you know, how do we meet people? How do we offer Jesus to people that is really meeting their needs? This other word I wanted to look at is, don't be slothful in zeal. Don't be lazy in zeal. But what does zeal really mean? To be zealous for something, it means that you put diligence and enthusiasm, even a haste focus on something that God declares as important. And you know what? I, I think Jesus, when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, go and love your neighbor as yourself, I think Jesus was asking us to be a little zealous for these things. To be zealous for the good news and for hope. Really, the question is, how do we show, this, this last part is, be zealous, if, if we follow it through, it says, be zealous to show hospitality, to offer hospitality to people. I think we can be zealous, but maybe not have the right target. Have you ever tried to show hospitality to someone and found out that it didn't really come off that way? Um, the first mission trip I ever went on was eight weeks in Mexico and living with a full-time missionary and... Um, we went all over the country. We went to the coast. We were living in Nesa, which is one of those rough suburbs in Mexico City, and playing football or soccer out in the street with um, gang members. I mean, we had some really rough experiences. In one particular village we went to, I remember, was two miles high up in the mountains, way distant. And, and in fact, um, we couldn't even ride the vehicle up there because the, the road was so horrible, and, and the suspension was, was, even though it was huge was not sufficient for people to ride. So we had to actually walk up the mountain as the vehicle carried our gear. And I remember the missionary giving us some advice before we got there and said, now, you need to be aware that this community we're going to is a very um, secluded community. In fact, I don't think they've ever had any, any white-skinned people there before. This is a new experience for them. Uh, but I want you to know, they are, they're pulling out all the stops. They're excited that you're coming. They know that you're bringing the message of Jesus with you. and They're excited you're coming. They are throwing a banquet. And they're preparing the best for you. And it's important that you receive that as a blessing. Um, even though it might not be what you're used to, make sure to eat all the food and appreciate the, what, what they give you. And I remember that night as we sat down to eat, Looking at the faces of my friends, the other youth missionaries, 
and watching them in, in their excitement be blessed by this meal and, and watching as we all realized together about the same time that the meal they were serving was a little hotter than we were used to. And I remember watching as we're all smiling and watching people's foreheads begin to beat up with sweat and begin to just perspire down the face and begin to see tears in the corner of their eyes that are rolling. And all of a sudden, literally, there's snot coming out of our, out of our noses and, and running down our face because our, we're just, we're exploding on the inside. It's just like they, they gave us this grenade to eat that just went <laughs> off in our mouths and, and we're hot. And I came out of that realizing, you know, we all want to bless other people, and we always want to put out our best. We want to give our best efforts, but sometimes what we offer others isn't what they want or need. And in fact, the only way to really bless someone is if we first of all know who they are, if we understand what their needs are and understand maybe you know, we're getting very sensitive about, you know, peanut allergies and other things about gluten allergies and providing even communion in that way because we understand that we have to meet the needs of people. We have to know the people that we're serving. This series is all about that knowing our community well enough that we bless them rather than just force something on them that isn't exactly where they're at. So how do we bless and how do we provide? And you've noticed some of the changes, even in just some of the hospitality that we're offering to people. But that's what we're going to talk about today specifically is hospitality. And again, I've asked Wendy to share just some of the things that she learned from her, her class on evangelism. That it's not just about knocking on doors. It's about how we meet people and offer hospitality. So there are four different ways that they define ways that we can show hospitality that are part of um, our communities today. What are some of those and how do we live into those? Like what we talked about last week, there are lifestyle segments and we are looking at the lifestyle segments that directly surround our church to try to understand who the people are that are, that are our neighbors. Different lifestyle segments connect with one or two different types of hospitality. And the way Mission Insight has divided it up, they've put it into four different, they've defined it as four different categories. The first category is called the basics. And this one is kind of what you would expect of just simple church hospitality. There might be a greeter at the door, but then once you're in, everyone kind of finds their own seat and they sit next to their friends and um, there may be some simple coffee and something that's offered, but it's, it's, it's just, it's the basics. Um, and there are lifestyle segments that prefer that for different, for different reasons. Some people don't like to see a big spread back there because they feel like that's, it's almost offensive because they think, why are we spending all of this energy doing this, that's not what's important here. And so there are, there are lots, people have different reasons for why they like different, different things. Um, one of the, what, the other one is called a multiple choice. And this is one that connects with more segments than any of the other, any of the other um, types of hospitality. Any of you like to have a choice when you go out to eat? And when you go to a restaurant, do you, do you like the menus that are like 12 pages long or one page long? <laughs> or all of a sudden, uh, your family, <laughs> can, can your family all go to the same restaurant? In some places, uh, can you all go to the same restaurant or does someone need to eat here and some want to eat there? People have gotten used to choices. Yes, and our neighbors that live around us, all of those groups are identified as preferring multiple choices. But it's not just about the food that, that we serve. Um, it's also about the way we offer hospitality on all different levels. So it's the way someone greets them at the parking lot and then at the door and then someone says hi to them in here and someone sits by them. It's the way they're engaged fully as they, as they are observing what happens here. And the interesting part is, of this is that these people are looking for not just what we say in our worship service, um, or not just our education programs, but hospitality is, is equally important. And they're paying attention to the way people are engaging each other. And they, they want to see that the spontaneous parts, the spontaneous things that happen here are genuine and that they, they exhibit Christian values 
does it does it support what's being said in the service or is it against is, that? Is there integrity in the yes. conversations that they see you having before service, after service? Or do they see that, that the program that's going on for the H2 Go for the kids, does that speak the same language and share the same values? They, they want to see that all of that is in line with each other. So the, the thing about this is that hospitality is... It's, it's all of our Here's, here's something else that, that Wendy helped me learn. Um, did you know that the most important hospitality is not what the pastor does? <laughs> it's not whether the pastor's out there greeting. They think the pastor has to be nice to them because it's, their, it's his job. Right, <laughs> right. But it's what each of you do. It's when people come into a congregation, whether or not they feel like all of that is in line. Yes. And the thing about hospitality is that if we think, sometimes we might think, well, hospitality just comes natural to us because we do love people and we do want to welcome people and we do want to invite people. But what we can kind of see from this is that if we think of hospitality only as natural, then we think about offering the kind of hospitality that we would naturally prefer. Like mole. Which is not necessarily really hot, spicy food. what our visitor or our guest would prefer. And so hospitality is something that needs to be, rather than natural, it needs to be something that's intentional. Right. Intentional and radical. Um, each of us know when somebody goes out of their way for us. We recognize that they're, they're treating us special. When they come over and knock on our door and say, we know, you know your family's going through something, we, we brought you a meal. That's radical. That's recognizing the needs in a family and caring for them. Um, so one of the big goals out of this, um, out of the multiple choice, anytime we can get people to mingle and actually connect and share relationships, that's valuable. Really all of this is about building relationships and we just we build relationships with different types of people in different ways. And, and part of it is our testimony is, you know, we can't really invite somebody into a relationship with Jesus Christ until you already have a relationship with them. It's, it begins to make that transfer, that handoff of sharing the good news. So the, there are, of the four types, there's also one called healthy choices, and oftentimes this is paired with the multiple choice. And these are, these are people that are specifically looking for things that are healthy, not only, not only food, but also just a holistic approach to healthy living. And this also involves environmental stewardship. They, they want to see that that's being cared for too in, in the serving utensils or in the types of food that are served. Anybody notice that there's fruit back there? I think that's awesome. I don't know about you, but that's, that's a, a bonus for me also. But it, it just is a, it's a focus on the fact that that is such an important part of ministry. And so any, anybody that can be involved in that, we all can. It's One of the things that we've, we learned is literally there will be people who will visit first time and they'll come to church. And even though the sermon might be great or okay, the music might be great or okay, but if they don't connect if they don't feel like um, what they're walking into is hospitable, if the kinds of, even the kinds of food or snack, even the kinds of coffee it doesn't meet their needs, they'll go hear another great sermon somewhere else. But they're going to find maybe the coffee that they're looking for or the relationship that they need. So the fourth one is... is um called takeout. And our segment that we're talking about today specifically identifies with this. And that is something where people don't necessarily, they come in right when service starts and they zip right out the door. <laughs> and so we may think, oh my, they really didn't like what they heard today. Maybe the music was bad or I don't know. <laughs> and they run right for the door. We won't see them again. But that's not necessarily the case. It's just sort of these people are used to living a much faster pace the of title, life. The title of the sermon is Fast Track Couples. Some of you might relate to that couples or singles in your life, it's just go, 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 go. But people are still hungering for relationship. And so they're just not maybe going to find it by mingling after, after service. A lot of these, the people that are in these segments want to be able to connect to people throughout the week digitally. Texting, an ongoing conversation throughout the day. How many of you have text conversations with 12 people at once and you only shoot a message here every hour or there every hour. And this, this, but this ongoing conversation. 
And it, small groups become really important with with many of the segments, but particularly with that one. Right. Well, and it's, it's some of you used to seeing me run out this door right after service. You want to know why? It's because I'm catching the people who are already gone. <laughs> I'm trying to catch them before they leave, just to say hi or make sure that, that I have contact information so I can check in with them later during the week. Now, the, the good news is this fast track couple thing, um, we're supposed to have these cards to hand out to each of you, and believe it or not, we ran out. Last week, we gave you ones that um, uh, were Babies in Bliss Generation and Generational Soup. soup. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, it's Fast Track Couples. And some of the things that they're looking for, um, they're looking for God through, uh, through a child's eyes. They're, they're looking to have connection but keep an objective distance. They're, they want to be social, sociable and spontaneous but simple. And, and um, they're looking for a, a group of people that has high devotion to family and high pursuit of personal growth. Those are things that they're looking for. Um, we're going to talk next week about worship. What is it they're looking for in a worship service, and how do we offer that? Um, wireless internet, video screens, cell phone. You know, some churches I've been to, and I'll, I'll look at the kids, and the kids are like on their phones doing this, and I'll, I'll think to myself, just stop playing those video games, would you? Uh, but I've also learned those kids who are playing video games, they're listening, they're multitasking, they're able to do that. And, and I've also found out the adults that are on their phones, often they're actually on their Bible apps reading the Bible verse or cross-referencing something because they've got all these tools now that they can engage the word deeper. And I encourage that. Um, this group is looking to connect quickly. They're looking to connect on the internet. And that's something we continue to try and find ways to do. And I would encourage you to continue to develop those relationships within the church circle. Connect with friends that you text throughout the week and say, hey, am I going to see you on Sunday? Am I going to see you at small group? Hey, how are things going? I know you've got this going on in your life. Those kind of relationships, even though they're via texting, they are vital and because people need those and they need accountability to their faith that way. Just knowing how people want to communicate is important. I think that this lifestyle segment we're talking about today really would, would like someone to text them something as they're leaving and connect them that way, whereas other segments would probably be offended right. if they had shared a prayer request with you and then you sent them a text message. They might feel like, well, don't they care enough about me to call me or to come visit me? But that's just, that's one of the reasons why we need to understand where people are coming from and what actually blesses them. Right. In that way, their language or communication is that different. So the overall takeaway from, from this particular group is... You want me to? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the people in this group are people that don't necessarily come from a strong church background, so they don't have they don't have this foundation of tradition or they don't know a lot about the sacraments, but they also are curious and they're quick learners. Um, they are very spiritual but just haven't been exposed to to the church all that much. And so any way that we can provide resources for spiritual growth and tools online, and to be accessible for these people is really, really vital. And I think because the, because the lives of people are so busy and they are kind of zipping back and forth, they, they do hunger for relationship and they're looking for that. They're, sometimes life can feel meaningless and empty. And so that's the kind of relationship that they're looking for when they, that's how they want to encounter God right. when they come to worship. Right. Um, if you've gotten on your Bible.com app and found the events, there's a follow-up 30-day devotional. It just takes 30 seconds to read that you can click on there and follow up with what we're talking about when it comes to hospitality. Because hospitality is about blessing other people in ways that they need to be blessed, in ways that communicate in their language. Um, again, I was supposed to have these cards to give you. I ran out with the extra large service at Hopkins uh, this morning. But on the back, there is this space where I was asking people to write names of people or families that you can think of that relate. So I encourage you to, you know, maybe write on your own piece of paper, uh, write in your notes on your Bible.com app, and, and make a note of somebody that you want to bless this week. And then pray for them. In, either invite them out for a meal or shoot them a text and just say, I love you and I'm praying for you. You've been on my mind, and God, I want to bless you. 
Think of ways to show hospitality, radical hospitality, that shines the light of Jesus Christ into someone else's life. That's what it means, and I'm, I'm telling you, that's what it means also to be a new church. Finding ways to be relevant in new ways, creative ways that connect with people um, where they are and for who they are. Um, let's enter into a time of prayer.